There are a number of different things that, that we do. I mean, you can, of course, coach online just as well as you can coach um, face-to-face. We, we have a lot of uh, experience in coaching virtually. So actually having an individual and coaching that individual through the medium of Zoom or Skype versus coaching them face-to-face, we, we've had extremely good results in coaching people uh, virtually. Um, we also, there's, there, are, there are a number of, of, of different um, online tools that we could use to help people both give and get feedback. So um, getting feedback about themselves from colleagues um, and then reviewing that feedback and helping them to work through it and to match their, their, their feedback on themselves with other people's feedback on them, you know, the classic 360 degree feedback. That works really well because with the virtual environment, with more and more people working in multinational um, organizations, it is far easier to get feedback from people from all around the world with whom you have contact by using a common um, internet available questionnaire to get them to fill in. And once you've got your data, you can then work with the individual. So, You're working with the individual and saying, so look, we've worked with you and we've talked about um, different set competencies around leadership and we've talked with you about, and you've talked with us about where you think you need to improve and where you think your skills are and where you think your weaknesses are. Well, now you've got this feedback from people from all around your network. Let's have a look and see what that tells us about how you perceive yourself and how others perceive you. And that can be really... um, full of insight for an individual because they begin to see that perhaps how they see themselves differs quite markedly from how other people see them. And you can see patterns in that feedback that um, they regularly undervalue themselves or they regularly overvalue themselves or they are regularly valued differently by people in a different function or in a different country. And that can be very uh, enriching for somebody. And all of that can be done and is done uh, entirely virtually. So I I think that the the opportunities that the virtual environment um, gives us for uh, global connectivity uh, can be really very, very helpful when you think about the degree to which so many of us now work in a globally connected organization or in globally connected roles, or particularly in stakeholder environments where the stakeholders are internationally connected in some way or another and these these diverse international stakeholder maps that so many of us have got to manage and control getting feedback from them about how they see and perceive us can be um, a a very rewarding experience a very helpful uh, career development experience as well personal development experience I think there was a huge difference and not just five years back. I mean, unfortunately, I now go back over a quarter of a century. So uh, I have a a lot of hindsight to look at. Um, I think that people are far more willing now than they were 15, 20 years ago to accept that they can learn about themselves to their own benefit. So... Nowadays, we regularly go into organizations and they say to us, we would very much like, please, to talk with you about emotional intelligence or authenticity or mindfulness or resilience or things which are about, if you like, uh, inside out feedback, things about me managing myself, me learning about myself. 20 to 25 years ago, that was really not the case. And it was really quite difficult to get organizations to do anything in that area beyond perhaps doing an MBTI indicator or something of that sort. So the degree to which organizations and individuals within organizations are hungry for um, increased self-understanding, self-awareness, self-knowledge and increased ways also to understand other people in order to work better in teams and in order to collaborate better. That has been a significant shift, I think. And I think that the other thing 
I mean, I'm interested. I, I, when you watch um, young people playing on things like PlayStation and Xbox, and you watch these hugely immersive games that they can play on these uh, on, on on consoles, and you realise how the bar has raised in terms of uh, what we will accept and 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 what we demand if we are to reward something by giving it our attention, and you realise that we have to constantly find ways of um, providing immersive experiences for people, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. Um, and the bar that is set is not the bar within our own industry, but it's the bar of the world around us. You know, cinema is hugely immersive, television is hugely immersive, the game, uh, the, the, the console industry is hugely immersive. And that's where people get their sense of what represents an immersive experience from. And that's what we have to compete with. And we, we need to be able to create for people experiences which are as rewarding, as immersive, and which help them to explore these things which genuinely interest them, which is part of what you might loosely call the human condition. Why am I the way I am? Why is he the way he is? Why do we not get along or why do we get along? How can we get along better? How can this team work better? How can this organization create and maintain a, a positive culture or whatever it might be? And I think I've seen significant strides in that direction. But I think as technology uh, continues to change, and I'm thinking about um, artificial reality and immersive things of this sort, so our industry will continue to need to um, find new ways of, of taking these immersive possibilities and bending them towards the kind of, exper kind of experiential learning that people want. And I think that, that's, what, that's what we have to do. We have to be really um, brave and courageous about trying out new ways to help people explore these things that they really want to find out about. I mean, I certainly think this, this thing I was, I was touching on a moment ago about the, the importance of the experiential. I think that that is truly important. I think that experiential learning is widely accepted to be the, the most compelling form of learning. How can we make more learning more experiential? What can we learn from uh, things like um, artificial reality? What can we learn from the gaming console industries? What can we learn from role playing? What can we transfer from the classroom to the online environment? But we, I think we have to keep at the front of our mind the entire time is if it's not experiential, then it's not as good as it could be. Um, I think Another thing for me is uh, interaction, interactivity. Everything we do has got to be not telling, but interacting. People learn from each other. People learn by doing. People learn by being uh, in teams engaged in doing things. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is, is often far more compelling than seer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, so I think that Experiential and interactive are two absolutely critical words for me. Um, and I think the other thing that I, I really think is, is going to become more and more and more important is coaching. I think that coaching's been around long enough now that, that we all know that it's beneficial. But I think that it's going to become absolutely mainstream. It will be an oddity not to be coached, not to have a coach. It will be strange not to have somebody who is a catalyst helping you to explore things, helping you to work things out, helping you to um, find answers to knotty problems that you have. Uh, and I think that that high quality coaching within organizations which we know helps leaders and which we know helps organizations will become absolutely 
the, the, the requirement rather than something that the very best have. Well, I think there have been huge changes in executive education. Um, I think that certainly at Ashley, the vast majority of executive education now has a virtual element before, during or after. Um, and that was certainly not the case 10 years ago, even five years ago. Um, I, th I think that the use of virtual learning in executive education is picking up dramatically fast. Uh, and I would agree with you that it was not the case a few years ago. But I think that in five years' time, there will be no difference between executive education and degree education, for example. I think one of the reasons why executive education was slightly slower was simply because with degree education, students get what you offer them. So if you choose to offer them online education as part of the package or as the whole of the package, that's what they get. But with tailored education, you are providing a service to the client. So you, the client needs to come halfway to meet you. You can suggest online, ed, ed, uh, online learning and the client can say, well, I'm not quite sure, perhaps not quite yet. Um, and of course, there are often issues and difficulties with things like client firewalls. But I think the other thing that maybe slowed down the adoption, but which I think is now pretty much a barrier that's being removed, is this idea that so much of executive education is experiential, experiential learning. And for a while, I think people felt that you could only really genuinely do experiential learning in a face-to-face -face environment. But I, I think that that belief is now not widely held. Uh, I think that people have now got lots and lots of examples of experiential learning in a virtual environment. And I think that this combination of the feeling that we can do experiential learning in a virtual environment and the benefits of things like the flipped classroom that I was talking about earlier on, where you use the virtual environment to do the heavy lifting of knowledge transfer. Um, the combination of those two things means that I, I do think that executive education, in terms of uptake of virtual learning as a live option, is, is catching up very quickly with um, degree education. I think it can be. Um, I think that for a lot of people, um, particularly in the, in the degree world, if they studied together for a year or two years for a master's degree, an MBA, whatever it might be, uh, and they, they, uh, they spent the vast part of every working week in each other's company for a protracted length of time, then the quality of that relationship that was formed would last the rest of their lives. And we regularly tell people that, that the relationships they make as students will last the rest of their lives. Um, I think that you can make high quality relationships in the virtual environment as well. Um, they're made in a slightly different way. I mean, strangely, there's quite a lot of um, anecdotal and even researched evidence about how because you're not actually going to meet somebody in the flesh and you're exchanging, you're communicating with them over the ether, as it were, people can sometimes be more open and more honest um, and more available to one another in that environment than they are in the face-to-face -face environment. So th there are sometimes relationships which, which, which flourish more in the virtual environment than they would do in the face-to-face -face environment. But I think that for most of us, what will happen will be we will get more and more used to blended relationships, relationships where we may very well spend quite a lot of time uh, interacting with somebody in a virtual environment and very comfortably. And then either before, during or after that period of virtual interaction, we may meet them as part of a course or as part of a, um, an introduction to a course or as part of a, the one face-to-face -face element on a one-year course or whatever it might be. And we will get used to this uh, this, this hybrid, this, this blend of a relationship which exists online and, and exists face to face. And I think that we, will, we are perfectly able to adjust 
to the different balances. It may be that somebody you see once a quarter and the rest of the time it's virtual, somebody else you see once a year and the rest of the time it's virtual, somebody else you see once a week and the rest of the time it's virtual. And we're, I think the more competent we get at um, building and maintaining virtual relationships, the more competent we will be at holding these different sorts of virtual relationships, some wholly virtual, some blended to different degrees. And we will simply become more competent at it because that's, that's the way we will develop, because that's the way society will go. It will become a social skill, that, a social muscle that we develop because we use it more. Well, I think it's really good to try to have as much um, informal interaction as you can. So it's really good to try to um, have chat rooms, discussion rooms, um, places where people can go to on the off chance of meeting somebody or places where people can go to and they can say, um, hey, look, I'll tell you what, we were having this discussion online. There's a few things I wanted to say I didn't get a chance to say. Can we meet in the chat room on Tuesday at four o'clock? So the chance to have an informal place where people can go and, and meet online, um, a chance uh, where people can go and post and leave messages, a, a message board, a, a chat room, as many opportunities for people to interact in as many different ways as they can. Um, and one of the things that we do from time to time is we encourage people to post um, kind of vlogs, video diaries of how they're getting on with their studies. Because then, of course, you get the opportunity to see somebody a little bit, um, rather than these rather dreadful little oval pictures which never bear any resemblance to the real person. But if people are going to be studying together, it's sometimes quite good to be able to say to them, just take a little bit of footage on your phone. Um, show us where you live or show us your, your, where you work or, you know, 15 seconds of the view from your office window and just post it. And uh, it, you can get some nice, interesting things that crop up out of that. And uh, people can start having conversations about the view from different windows of different offices around the world. And things like that can just cause us to begin to have conversations um, on a more personal level and that can often be the start of then creating a place of psychological safety where people can feel they can share with a bit, bit more security well I mean I think embrace it certainly yes I, I certainly think you should embrace it I think we've got to we've got to trust in the imagination and the creativity of the people who understand this environment and let them have their head. Let them play with it. Let them show us what they can do with it. And let's not forget that there are two things here. There is the medium and there is the message. And there are many, many people in the world, uh, long-standing academics who understand the message, who know what we were trying to say, but who aren't necessarily particularly familiar with the medium. And there are many, many people who are very, very familiar with the medium, but they may not be that familiar with the message. So let's put these two sets of people together. Let's put these really creative people who understand exactly what you can do in this extraordinarily exciting space, together with the people who understand exactly what we should be saying in this learning opportunity. And they may be very different people with very different backgrounds and very different levels of experience and very different ages, but each has got something that's really important. One understands the medium, one understands the message. And if we can get them working together, we're going to create some magic. And then let's be brave about it. You know, we learn by doing things wrong, not by doing things right. So let's be brave, let's try things out, let's get lots and lots and lots of feedback loops so that we keep on learning by doing, learning by doing, learning by doing. And I think that we've got to do it that way because no sooner do we learn how to do it than it changes. New technology, new opportunity, new way of doing things, 
Um, and so we have to learn that and we have to keep on learning and keep on learning and keep on learning. So it's, it's a constantly iterative process. And the sooner we get to grips with it, the sooner we'll be riding the wave rather than hurrying along trying to catch it up or get to the edge of the sea at least. And I think courage and perseverance, really. You know, there's those two things that we never have enough of, either of them, courage and perseverance. The first thing to say is, it's hard to imagine, and it should be hard to imagine, because I think that the changes are going to be so huge that if I could imagine what it was going to look like, that wouldn't be right. Um, I do, I personally think that um, artificial reality, augmented reality, call it what you like, is going to have a huge role, both online and, and in other interactions. I mean, I, I go back to this point about compellingly immersive experiences which are relevant are absolutely what we should be trying to create for people. And it seems to me that um, augmented reality, artificial reality, begins to offer us ways of doing that which could be highly tailored, highly customised, and give people the opportunity to try things out in a reality that reflects the reality they have to deal with, where there is absolutely no risk attached to failure. Therefore, there is nothing but benefit to exploring, experimenting, doing things differently. And I think that that would be really exciting. Um, I also think that the, the dissemination of good thinking will be much, much easier in 10 years' time than it is now. Uh, and I think that the ability to show the successful application of theory to practice will be much easier. And that's really, for me, what good executive education is about. It's about saying, look, here is some really reliable thinking. And here's what happens when you apply that thinking to your practice. Now, we need to be able to give people a chance to explore that. And then we need to be able to disseminate the thinking around that so that as many people as possible get to hear and experience that so they can explore it. So I think that the, the, the immersive experience and then the dissemination of the thinking. I think we will get far, far better at, at both of those things. And what people will do in their management development experiences in 10 years' time will be unimaginably more interesting than what they were doing 10 years ago or even than what they are doing today. And how we get those experiences shared and how we get mutual learning from those experiences will be much simpler, much faster, and much more effective. That's what I hope for anyway.